Well, I want to appreciate y'all coming out for talking a little bit about turning data into decisions. And it's my goal, I do not have a presentation. Uh, I got a couple thought-provoking slides to get us started, but this is always intended to be a true roundtable discussion. And so uh, we've got a small crowd, so I'm going to need everyone to participate. Uh, you can make the run for the door at this point. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, to give you a heads up, the Isbels can't leave, though. They're not allowed to leave. <laughs> uh, we, while you're sitting there, I'll, I'll say a few things, but I'm going to call on everybody to introduce yourself. Uh, and you introduce yourself who you're with, and then either one question you have about how to turn data into decisions in terms of agricultural data into an agricultural production decision, uh, or uh, something that you have found has been a great way to use data to make a better decision on your farm or in your, in your research. For some of the researchers in here, you know, if you get too long-winded, I'm going to come kick you. So, <laughs> Dr. Borland starts giving us a dissertation on something. That's uh, we're going to get my heart No. So, uh, I am Ed Barnes of Cotton Incorporated, and I appreciate y'all coming out. I think this is a topic we used to do kind of a how to get started in precision ag. And then we started to realize that most people had all the basics figured out. And how, so the question, and I still get this a lot, you know, how do you go to the next level? I got all this data, what do I do with it? And so, uh, you know, just an example, as you're preparing to ask your questions or do whatever, here's an example of some, you know, data. This is kind of what, when I think of, you talk to me about precision ag, this is kind of what I think of. On the left, I got a sand map of a field that came from, electrical conductivity data, and the blue in that picture is, has less sand, the yellow has more sand, and then I got three years of yield maps. And you can see this, the cotton doesn't like the sandy spot because this is an irrigated field and it's all irrigated the same way. So, you know, so what decisions can we make from that? Uh, Stephen is with Cotton Incorporated, he'll introduce himself in a second, but one of the projects he's working on, and maybe you can, when it comes your turn, you can say a little bit about it, working with quails forever, maybe you put that in the wildlife habitat, all right? Uh, what else do you do? Maybe David Wilde was is an Arkansas producer, he has sand blows on his farm, and he use this technology to start putting out gin trash in the sand blows and then he actually went back and yield monitored it for a couple of years to look was it economically you know was was the cost of putting out and he was putting out like two tons per acre and this wasn't a little bit of organic matter he put out a bunch out there was it worth the cost to do that was he getting enough yield increase and in his case he concluded he was so there was a and i've noticed one thing about farmers my solution to some of these problems is I'm just going to cut my inputs, right? I don't have much yield potential there. But I know there's no farmer who figure out how can I remediate that and get my yield back. So those are, you know, different decisions. Um, in reality, you know, a lot of this stuff, so this is kind of easy, right? This looks somewhat easy, straightforward. But how many of you have made some maps like this? All of you that have showed up here. It's not that easy to get that map to where you can trust it, is it? It's not that easy. And, and we're just talking about one field with a very obvious feature. I know many of you are managing, you know, 40 to 100 fields, and you don't have the luxury to ponder them, uh, you know, for, for days at a time. So that's where some of this challenge comes. How can we take this data? And your tractors now, as you all know, are tracking, uh, they're collecting a lot of data, fuel use, uh, you know, application rates, uh, elevation, every time they go through the field, if you have an RTK GPS autosphere, you know, all that data is just piling up. And are there ways we can take advantage of it without turning your, you know, without hiring a data analyst to come onto your farm? So that's kind of the, the discussion I'd like to have with you today. And so you've been warned now, and uh, I would like everyone, we'll go around, introduce yourself, say who you're with, 
what's your question about data or where has data helped you out? And if it's really interesting, we'll, we'll, dis we'll start the discussion with your comment. Otherwise, I'm going to kind of compile those comments and try to do some guiding discussion after that. So we'll start right here with Liz. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz. I'm the CEO and founder of Trellis. We help farmers make uh, decisions and be smarter uh, with with the tools at our disposal. So we've got some different kinds of sensors that we offer to farmers uh, to help them make decisions. And we are focused on, on drilling the data down to make it very easy to understand and know what the heck to do with it. So we care a lot about, obviously, this topic. But um, thinking uh, about something that we don't currently touch with our products is I'm interested to know how you guys use or if you use imagery uh, to make decisions and how you use that in your day-to-day -day work on the farm. Thank you. Hi, I'm Peter Nesbitch. I'm the director of business development for Trellis, so I'm directly with Liz. She said a lot of what I would have said <laughs> in terms of what we do and how we benefit growers. Uh, but, you know, what I'd really like to learn specifically about cotton, since I deal with a lot of cotton growers uh, with our tools, is the nutrition requirements for cotton and the ideal delivery system for that. Uh, I understand a lot about corn, but cotton, I'm still a little, I'm not a little familiar with, so would like to learn more about that. Thank you. Brad, Bob, Bill, Farm Press. Uh, you know, I have a question, but I'm always, I was curious about the reliability of data and how it conflicts with uh, new data coming in. Reliability of data, that's a good one. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tommy Young from Jackson County, Arkansas, and I guess uh, my family's tried to embrace our farm with two younger nephews, not too much younger, but younger nephews, and we've tried to embrace different aspects of our farm with uh, technology, and uh, I guess one key thing that I would say that's helped me is we've uh, went with irrigation uh, sensors and uh, monitoring of all of our center pivots and using weather stations. And um, it's turned me into a much better irrigator. Uh, in the past, when I was uh, irrigating, I thought you needed to keep it wet enough to keep a goldfish alive <laughs> in, uh, in our corn middles. And I've since found that you do not have to have that. And it saved me a tremendous amount of money and also wear and tear on my machinery. Plus, I'm making, I would feel like better crops. So uh, uh, that was one, one tag, and then we saw how good that worked, and then we moved over to trying to make our farm be more where I could keep up with everything, no matter where I was. And so today, everything that I do, I can watch my tractors move, I can look at my fields, I can know what yields I've made, and then we've added Brent here as, a, as our guy that takes all of our soil sampling and and it's made me to where I feel like I'm much more efficient, and it all ties together with trying to be efficient. So you don't be afraid to, to move in that direction. Some great insights, sir. Thank you. My name is Brent Leister. I own a uh, crop consulting business in, in Arkansas, and we provide. I mean, this this topic drew me in here because this is what we do. This is what it's all about. If we can't do this. We're useless to grow. So we're, we're utilizing a lot of data. We're producing a lot of data. Uh, we, we actually fly our own imagery. Uh, I'm a commercial pilot for my son as well. We provide uh, you know, full service consulting services as well as uh, soil testing, as Tommy mentioned. Um, so we're trying to stay on the forefront of, of all the technology out there, moisture sensor equipment, helping uh, farmers irrigate more properly and timely, uh, and conserving our resources as well. So um, this is just a very attractive topic for me. So you're, this is what you do for a living, so i got to ask you another question. Sure. Uh, but now, out of all the things, all the data that you work with, if you had to pick one as your favorite, or one that you consistently get value out of, could you do that? Or, or maybe it's a combination of like trying to pick your favorite child. I mean, they're, they're all important. They, all those layers and the more layers that we yield data, uh, imagery, uh, soil data, uh, soil type, you see that 
intimidated. All those layers. Every time I get more information, I feel like I'm more informed and I can make better decisions. So they're all important. Uh, being able to just pick one, I mean, I just be like crawling out of a hat, I guess. I mean, yield data is very, very important. That seems like we really struggle on the farm to collect that. So that seems to be come to the forefront of my mind is, you know, when a grower is, is harvesting and they're in the middle of it and something breaks, we just, they just keep cutting. And, and I understand that because I am a farmer as well, but I, I almost, I wanted to treat it like if, if a planter row quit planting, it's, it's almost that important that we need that data to continue to make, we, we've got, we got to a high level for the productivity <coughs> already. we just got to keep moving forward now. We made the macro decisions. We need to make the micro. And those small things that will arise is what's, what we try to focus on. No, thank you. I appreciate those additional comments. Galen? Yes. Galen, I'm Galen Morgan. I'm the Cobb Incorporated. I just started back in June. Previously, I was the state cotton <coughs> specialist in Texas for our bottle variety evaluation and agronomics and things like that. Uh, as far as <coughs> sensors and technology, you know, I think there's just a lot of opportunities with autonomy. You know, there's some major bumps in the road. but collecting a lot more data as that equipment goes through the field anyway. We can put some of that on equipment that's currently being used or as autonomous vehicles go through the field collecting more crop data, uh, which would then add additional layers. I think the other thing that's probably, that would help a lot is knowing more and sensing more that's under the ground. What are those roots seen in and how can we better uh, use that to breed for new cotton lines or to better make more efficient use of our nutrients or remove plow pans or whatever. So thank you. Uh, I'm Adam Shea, I work with Weston Foods uh Sub Arkansas and uh, I I missed the question, I came in a little late, sorry, but what attracts me to the topic is uh, I do our sustainability at Weston and uh, a lot of the drive um, well I mean I would say it's small but it trend it, it kind of Kind of comes from all of the traceability demand from the customers and consumers. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, when it comes to sustainability, it's all about telling the story at the farm level, uh, you know, through data. And I think that's kind of what I was asked the other day, you know, kind of, you know, what would be the one thing that you would want people to hear you say? And I think where, where I've struggled uh, has been, you know, it's not that it's, it's the same within our company. I mean, it's, it's going on everywhere. It's not that a lot of the data doesn't exist that we need. Uh, it's just that it's not in a proper format that can be shareable um, and kind of transposed over. And so, you know, I know there's a lot of data that is not captured yet. Um, but, you know, I, I like to say we're a melting pot of farmers. Um, you know, we've got everybody from the most progressive farmer that you'll see here talking, you know, all the way to the guys that, you know, uh, I'm not saying it's wrong, but they do the way they've always done. So I just, I think that what what we need for the future of our company, and I'll stop, is just we need for the membership to be able to tell their story through data. So I, I love to be able to hear more of that as they're doing this every day. Now, that's a really good segue into Stephen, <laughs> uh, who also yes. works in sustainability. <laughs> yes, uh, Stephen Pierce, sustainability manager, kind of incorporated, some of you heard my talk earlier. And uh, the, piggyback on what Ed said earlier, um, so I was going to talk about that. We have a project that uses data with, um, it's a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant that we won working with uh, pheasants and quail forever. So the idea is using data to kind of highlight unproductive regions of growers fields and then um, kind of look at a return on investment calculation. So, you know, are they just continuing to plant, put uh, inputs there and um, kind of get zero to very, very low yields and what is the payback period there? Is there something else they could do? So we'll um, use Quail Forever to kind of link them up with other programs that might be um, maybe entering in some sort of conservation easement or a CRP program or something like that. So it's great because it works towards all the sustainability goals. If you're putting a bunch of stuff on the land and not getting anything back, of course that's bad for your um, metrics. And then on top of that, you get to improve habitat and um, that's great. All the brands and retailers like here that you know, we're increasing pollinator and biodiversity habitat. There's all these metrics on that with field to market as well. And, um, and then from the producer perspective, you get to uh, have additional revenue streams maybe through these programs. And um, 
you know, you get to potentially hunt quail on your property, which is cool if you're into that sort of thing. So that's kind of a win-win for everyone. It's a pretty cool program. It uses data to kind of start the conversation with the grower. So it's very nice. Thanks, Stephen. Yep. Anyway, when I'm farmer up in North Alabama, um, I've been doing precision ag way back under before it was even called precision ag. And the one constant that we've seen is the question, what do you do with the data? And how do you handle it? That's everybody's question. And the one thing I've realized over the years, we've learned to use data better when we start collecting it because we know what we're going to do with it and we learn a way to use it. And one of the constant things that you're going to see in Precision Ag is change. And you've got to be willing to change. Uh, the, the change in how you collect your data, change in what platform you use uh, is very important because you, you're not going to be able to use it if you don't get some something that you can use. A very good point. Thank you. Uh, Mike Smith, I was uh, recently retired from a bank trust department and uh, administered farm leases and I'm doing that as a consultant now. And what I'm amazed by is the quality of the data that is available and that uh, makes the farmers better at what they do. And uh, I've watched the Isabels who lease some property for me since 95 and watched them grow and implement precision technology and just amazed at the growth of them at that period of time. So as a landlord, do you like seeing the data? Yes. Yeah, you might see it. Uh, Shane is one. Okay. Oh, man, I'm over there. <laughs> I, sift, I sift through all this data that, that he's talking about um, every year. I'm not sure I can tell you the best way to use it, but I can tell you that over the last 20 plus years, being able to learn how to use that and keep up with it has been one of our greatest tools. I can tell you that comparable rate seeding the aerial imagery we're asking about, those inputs coming from all that, and fertilize the fertility part through this data and being able to make those decisions because our inputs are so high. We got to cut costs somewhere. So we got to learn how to use this data to better, you know, control our costs for our inputs. And I think that's the biggest thing today with commodity prices so low. We've got to learn how to use this data better. So I'm willing to listen to y'all brought on so hard tonight. Uh, thank you, Shane. I belong to this one. <laughs> <laughs> He's another. I'm a sixth generation of child. Of the land. Um, I get to actually, I guess you'd say, instead of making to look through it and sift through it, I'm using the, the information in the tractor and applying today, or making the data. I'm the one pulling the soil samples every year and the different zones that we make. And, um, I'm 28 years old and you asked me when I was 13, riding on a full wheeler with him who would do an irrigation, but I didn't be able to have an iPad or have my phone today do what we do, and I get to go, well, this is where I'm at in the field. You know, it amazes me, and I know it amazes him down there. Um, I really don't have a question. I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> All right, thank you. In the back, too. My name's Chico Williams. I'm from Mississippi, and I'm a corn and soybean farmer and we collect a good bit of data with our tractors and our combines and stuff and I, I guess my question would be who's the right person or the right company not that I'm soliciting for anybody to solicit me. Everybody that comes along and charges seven dollars an acre to analyze our data and tell us what to do with it and I don't know what part of it's worth seven dollars. I mean it could be worth a lot more than that but uh, just what what to do with it and what it's worth and what to what to pay for the information that we, it's already our information, but people want us to pay them to, to do something and analyze it. Yeah, I, I share some of your skepticism or and questioning, yes. Uh, what can someone, I email you my data and you can tell me what to do. That's, yeah, that's right. I don't quite buy into that business model, but good question. In the very back there. I'm Jane, I'm from UAPB Consulting. We are working here, I'm working with my advisor on rice so that we will bring the crop visiting so we could reduce the, the unwanted cost for the, those crops and get uh, 
profits in this maximum. And then we are using data so that further we can compile that data and use it for further crop insurance premiums to be calculated. Yeah, that's thank you. Uh, Edward Youngman, I'm with a seed company called Seed, seed, uh, seed, uh, seed Forest Genetics and also Farming South Texas. I'm just interested in that. I'm just, just to see what's going on. All right, good deal. When they have variety of performance is a key data point. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, my name is Brad Mills. I'm an ag economist at Mississippi State, uh, the Delta Research and Extension Center. Um, uh, I research mostly on profitability in ag. I'm really interested in how do we actually use this data in a profitable way. Um, so a lot of people talk about analysts. We don't really know very well those causal relationships to be able to give you the maximum um, profitability. We don't, really know. we don't know if two and a half acre or five acre grids is the most optimal or economically optimal. So that's kind of where my um, research area is. Interesting. Great. Wes? I'm uh, West Florida, University of Georgia. My question is, we've been talking about data and precision ag for long, probably longer than I've been alive, to be honest, in some of this work. Why is it still so hard, as you alluded to, Ed, to actually do some of this work and get anything out of data? We can have gigabytes and gigabytes of data, but sitting down and getting something usable out of it is beyond too difficult for the resources that we really, the computing power we have available out there. Yeah, yeah, why isn't it happening? Good question. R.L. Frank at LSU Ag Center, County Agent in East Carroll and Madison Mary. Been working with GIS that way years now. Uh, I realize the data that's there and how much the potential is there, but getting people to use it is my problem. Too. Even the simplest form, getting them to use it. I may have to find that along with the cohort there. <laughs> Dennis Burns, county agent in Tensel County, who's from Corning Parish uh, in northeast Louisiana, and uh, do GIS for the Ag Center with RL. <clears throat> One thing, we've been dealing with this for years, and the only thing I can say is the quality of data has gotten better and the volume has gotten more. And, and I'll throw this out here and ask y'all's opinion. We just had a, the Ag Center just had a ag, um, digital data conference. And, our next step we're looking for, and RL and I have been discussing this, is doing small workshops. <clears throat> we, we recommend that whoever you are, if you're a farmer, hire somebody. You know, you're talking about it, hire somebody. You, you're overwhelmed. But we want to try and have a workshop and play, teach people what questions to ask. You know, don't just email your data and say, what do I do? Email it to them, let them analyze and do the numbers, crunch the numbers, and then you know what questions to ask. You know, why does this, you know, there's a big red spot here in the middle of this field. Is that actually low fertilizer or is that just a wet spot where we miss the water? You know, those questions. Learn, learn to do that. So that's where we think we can go next to help a couple more. Thanks. I am Sarah Bird and with Indigo Ag and I cover North Alabama and the Central Mississippi Delta and I'm interested in this talk just as a research economist with Indigo I'm out taking drone flights, um, fixed wind and quadcopters, installing soil sensors um, and weather stations and so just seeing all of that come together I haven't been in this very long so to learn from somebody you know a consultant like him that's um, been out and taking drone flights I just think it'll be really all right, great. Thank you. Dr. Borman, I'm Fred Borman, I'm kind of here at the University of Arkansas. I'm, I'm drawn to areas that I'm most eager in, and this is one of uh, I've always been amazed with the pretty pictures that you get from precision ag and, uh, and the real questions of, of how it's fitting. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I'm really uh, very aware of the variability of data and how you connect variability of data to the pretty pictures. Then perhaps my greatest interest is to, uh, with drones and some other uh, things, to be able to uh, collect data on a small plot. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's some real opportunities to determine different maturities, particularly the cotton out in the field. That can be useful as a production tool, but also 
uh, for us as researchers to be able to help. And there's other areas as well. But I'm here to learn not to talk. All right. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Sure. Hi, I'm Stacey Gorman. I'm with the Cotton Board based here in Memphis. I actually live in Arkansas. Um, and my role with the Cotton Board is producer outreach and education. Um, we administer a program called the Cotton Research and Promotion Program. It's all about increasing uh, producer profitability. So for me, I think what I'm hoping to, to learn, um, based on some of the questions I've already heard in the room, you know, what are some of the most credible ways um, that you receive information like this and what leads you to act? So is it, you're hearing it from a peer, you're hearing it from a consultant, is it based on an article you've read? Um, what kind of leads you to act and make those decisions when it comes to data? All right, I'm David Miller, I'm the Regional Communications Manager uh, with the Cotton Board from the Mid-South. Uh, my previous job was doing exactly this, was working with the data management software I have used and have been exposed to almost every single one out there, and I've seen the benefits, and each one kind of has, a lot of growers that I've worked with use all of them, but they use each one for a different purpose, which is frustrating. Um, you have to sign up for a program just to be able to do this, and uh, to meet certain requirements, um, which I know a lot of this is changing and going to different things, and, uh, and I, I was over sustainability, uh, working with rice mills and stuff, and doing field printing, and using software, and I guess what I'm most interested in now, which is what I've been seeing people trying to use, is the NDVI imagery to scout and look at plant health uh, from your computer and know which spots to go look at instead of just kind of, well, I walked these three roads, this looks good, but you know, using NDVI imagery, you're like, okay, something looks off of plant health or, you know, adjusting your fertilizing, stuff like that. So. Well, you do have some unique experiences as well. So we've got, we've really got a perfect mix of people in here right now. So. Uh, yes, sir. Would you? I, I would make an observation using me as an example. After hearing their conversations, because the the gist of it is like what do you do with it and how do you do with it. In my particular family, about five years ago, we had all we bought, spent thousands and thousands of dollars equipping every piece of equipment we had with the best monitors, with, with everything we had. We were. We even put scales on our grain carts and calibrated our grain carts where our yield monitors were collecting all of that. And so we were getting the data in, but it was like on the combine, it was on the sprayer, it was all that. And so I went to a meeting in Florida and Farmer's Edge, I'll say their name, was there. And so it really appealed to me to, that because they were going to collect all of that and compile it into a format that I could use. I worked with them for a couple of years and they were had the concept down, but they didn't have the personnel in our area to do a really efficient job of getting the task at hand. And so uh, this, y'all are gonna think is a, as a uh, sales pitch for John Deere, and I'm not related to John Deere, I'm just a customer, mm -hmm. but the, they had what they referred to as my John Deere. And we bought into that. And we, we used their wireless technology to make all of our equipment to where it's all wireless. And so therefore, my data, I have three years of data on my phone. And with Brent here, like he mentioned about the layers, now that I've went through a full rotation, and we're like corn, wheat, beans on a lot of our farms. Well, I went through three years now. Well, I've got me a rotation. So I can take those layers of those fields and see. And we have utilized that data to put, overlay our fertility with our yield and determine that we thought we were doing a good job with some potash. Brent there noticed, well, hey, you're, you're really low here. And so, that data there, if you want to make it work, you can have all the equipment you have, but you've got to have some sort of platform, and there are a number of platforms out there that you probably can do, but you need someone to culminate it into some format that you can use in real time, because real time is when you need it. You don't need it six months later when you've forgotten about it, or, you, or you're in the heat of the battle doing something else. So, 
I'll just say that we're, we've, we've ta it's taken us a long time to ever get there, and we're still every year making our shapes better and making all that better, but you need some something there that brings it all together into one, and uh, you're probably going to need to go one step further and get with, a, with some sort of organization, a company, that can do that. Yeah, find compatibility with my John Deere with that and wireless data transfer. Agri Edge Syngenta came out with a free program. If you if you use it, yeah. and, and it was our first first taste of being where we could utilize uh, shapes. And you shape using that word even is, a, is what's not the shape? Well, that's your field. Right. And naming them all, and that has made it to where we could progress into where we are now. Well, and I think you really hit a key point that answers some of the earlier questions was about compiling data. And when I first started doing this from a research perspective, I'm like, why aren't these guys downloading their yield maps? Well, it's because they're in the middle of harvest and the picker's 20 miles from the shop and they got another one over here and this one's broke down and they're not going to worry about moving the data part. And so I think whether it's my John Deere or Climate or Slingshot, I really do agree with you that the ability to transfer your data in your real time wirelessly is going to make, that's going to be one hurdle overcome. I want to say one last thing that I'll sure. say more. But my older brother is 76, I'm 56, my nephews are 45. Well, they can't understand that when the yield monitor breaks down, the combine stops. But you know, we do. We we want that fixed before we continue to harvest. They say, why in the heck aren't you harvesting? You know, well, our data's lost. It's like you said, you don't move the yield part. <coughs> so, I mean, it's that important to us now to collect that data. And and we harvested 2,065 acres of corn and was less than 1% off of scale ticket. Wow. So. You're getting figured out. And you can keep saying more. Please don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so I think wireless data, and I think that's where the soil moisture sensors have, have, that's been the game changer in my mind. The wireless, the ability to deliver data quickly and affordably. Um, and I use, we got a couple people mentioned soil sensors. You know, I think that's a, a really, I'll say low-hanging fruit for, for data and decisions, right? Like with cotton, we kind of know between, we depend on soil type 30 to 70 centibars. If you get near there, you probably don't want to water. All right, that's a, you know, that's a, now, make sure you're measuring at the right depth, and that'd be through talking with a lot of subtleties to that, but still, it's kind of a, a threshold, right? So it's not that easy with some other things. So I want to, a couple of you have mentioned imagery, and I have to watch myself, because that was my first job with my PhD, was working on imagery. And that's actually like a, a, a satellite image from 1990 in Arizona, all right? So back then, we were working with satellite imagery, and we had, you know, we were excited to get down to three meter resolution. That was a breakthrough. And we had been working with airplanes. I know you said you're flying. Uh, but it's been a struggle I've watched. So I've watched for the last, Sadly, 30 years, and you know that question that Wes asked. You know, what's we've we've seen some potential in all this. What's holding it back? And I started looking at these UAVs, man. And I'm impressed. I got it. That data is, you know, millimeter resolution is crazy. If you fly that low, you need to fly higher. Um, but I want to hear from some of you that you identified images as something that you're using. What do you find as some examples of the value you're capturing from the endless beyond because I remember when I first started working in this area it was all about anomaly detection all right we're going to fly and it was color infrared film some of it and we're going to show you oh you know there's a there's a spot in your field we're going to show you that there's a spot in your field we got there's a spot in this field because it's a salinity problem or you know a low spot so that anomaly detection didn't really sell very well and so we've tried to move beyond that for a long time so some, some of you that would be willing to share some of your experiences, what are some of the valuable things you've caught from imagery, and whether that's imagery, airborne, UAV, satellite, Dennis? The, Lauren, I worked with Dr. Jabani at LSU 
several years, for good many years. Well, we're still working with them with sugar cane. Um, and using aerial imagery, and either drones or planes or satellites. And gen as a general rule, you fly cotton twice. You fly an early bloom. Use an algorithm to determine, use a reference strip. You have an over-fertilized reference strip. Use that and your farmer standard to determine nitrogen rates, whether you need more, when you need, you know. Most of the time we get it where we put 50 to 75 percent of our nitrogen side dress, then we came back better using a reference strip and an NDVI and figured out whether we needed more. At early bloom, that's on cotton, and then you fly a week before the foliation. With that, you look at nematodes, you look at any other problems that show up, early maturity, that type. Any other problems will generally show up about a week before. Soybeans, you fly once, about before you burn. And that shows up nematodes, same thing. Uh, corn, we flew it, what, V6 to V8? Yeah, right in that, in that window, here again for nitrogen. I mean, we didn't see, we, and we flew a lot. I mean, we actually had uh, one trial. We actually flew every seven to ten days one summer. Also, so every, week, every, week. Yeah, every week on soybeans, and we also <laughs> physically scouted the field. And other than uh, coffee beans were in the field, when we had stink bugs, we had red banded stink bugs at treatment levels, the NDVI didn't show up. Sweet net show. So, I mean, there's, there's, they're very good information. But flying it weekly or getting weekly stuff, that's just stuff you stick on the refrigerator. You know, pick out the times that you concentrate on and work with those. You know, I mean, oh, it's a nice picture, but what the hell? You know, it's just a picture. I think it's also something that gets overlooked with it. And we kind of touched the scratch barely the surface of the work, but like you mentioned, NDVI, yeah, that's the one we use all the time. Mm -hmm. like, there's how many benefit indices that we could probably use and apply to it. It may or may not help with some of that stuff. Our NDVI is only one of them. Well, we've got the ability to collect more, but let's go back to it. What's our processing time on it? What can we get out of it? We flew weekly too, we pulled tissue samples when we flew, and all this stuff. And um, we've got piles and piles of data, so I need somebody that just wants to sit in the room for a year and a half and do correlations for me. We can maybe answer some questions, but you know, that's what it comes back to, right? We end up with this much data, we gotta find somewhere to go. And so far, like I said, and this is what we've used in NDVI, because we've been using it for 20, 20, about 30 years. And it works. So. And, and, and we've learned how to use it. And we use green NDVI, you know, like on beans and cotton in mid season. When we flow, we use green NDVI instead of red. Shows up better, but we're not really, when we walk that field, there's just not much there. It didn't show disease, didn't show anything. And we could see the coffee we got out of the truck when we drove up. So. Yeah, one thing we learned fly for a purpose. Fly yeah. for a purpose. I, I, I like that. Fly, I mean, I mean when I first introduced this to the farmer, we'll fly that field and tell me what's wrong with it. I, I can't tell you that anything then, yeah. but you tell me you think there's something, or you we're flying for a purpose, looking for something. Yeah. Brings out what you're looking for. If you just fly in general, just go out here and fly the parking lot just for fun. fun. Okay, you said offer all data, fly, exactly. fly for, I mean, look for, look for a reason purpose. and collect the data just because, I mean, we read the Bible, but we don't have to, we, there's certain scriptures that you pay more attention to than others, and so I would say that with the data, collect it all and then look for what, if we've got a problem on that one field, then look at that field. Yep. yep. Have you all had much exposure, though, with now all the retailers and manufacturers have their own version of NDVI imagery? And the problems I've seen is they only put in pictures every three days. If it's cloudy, well, then it's useless. And I mean, it's, I mean, it's a big thing. We run into the cloudy issue, you just fly and drop. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, we got, we, we, one of us was flying and one of us watching the sky. See so if the cloud was moving right. across on them. Yeah. I mean, because it'd be beautiful sky. By the time you get off the ground halfway through it, a, a cloud would just roll over and like, skew everything. Were any of y'all around in the days of end time here in Mississippi, you know? Yeah. And they had a great product. I mean, that was a really good product. But then they had, you know, when people were doing plant growth regulators with it. It was, a, you know, they would fly and turn that inventory around in 24 hours and have it on the website. And you could download it to your applicator. And then they had about three weeks of clouds in the mid south. And, you know, can you wait for three weeks to do your farming sometimes? Probably not. So that is, 
that shows some limitation on some of this. I, I like the idea of uh, how many of y'all do use check scripts? Like, you know, put out a high fertilizer rate. <laughs> Not really. I was about to say, no, we're using the Louisiana too. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had a real interesting situation where we still use antenna, but I planted some tillage radish just about uh, three passes angling across the field. Just experimental. The first image we got back, you could see it dead to the road. I mean, it was angling across the field, and you could pick that out on that image. It was just literally amazing how much difference just those few tilly radish and that one field, angling across the field, made. Um, of course, we, you, we always put growth rate levers down with an image. To follow that all our cotton images. Can you tell you the number of times that I have seen sprinklers out on a pivot? Figure out that I've got a problem in a field and go out there and it's because there's a sprinkler out. We had a cornfield about five or six years ago that had some chemical damage. We didn't realize it had chemical damage until they flew the aerolimetry for the cotton, but it picked up the cornfield beside it. We went out there and went an ear on the corn, six foot tall. And it was showing up from aerial imagery, but it wasn't showing up to the eye yet. It was just one spot through a field. I can't tell you the number of problems we have picked up like that in the last 25 years from aerial imagery. We do end time, we're spraying four or five trips of plant growth regulators every year with the more sensitive with the plane. But John Deere does satellite imagery every week. And I can't tell you, I fixed 10 or 12 sprinklers just last year off weekly satellite images. Is that from, do they, is that included with your My John Deere subscription? Yeah, you pay for it, yeah. Is it, but it is, is it DNA? It's through the Ag DNA, that's correct. Yeah. And what yeah, so If you go to a precision account through Ag DNA, that's, you can have that. What the precision <coughs> the sprinkler, the sprinkler the issue can be a big one because you'll catch it. You'll have one sprinkler not turning in a cornfield, and it's on an 1800 foot system. You're not going to see that. And you get that corrected, it, it makes a big difference. That's a good, good example. And I didn't know that time was still fun. That's good to know. They've been bought. Helena Chemical Company owns End Time now. So okay. That's yeah. Yeah, that's what I was saying. All the retailers, everybody's coming. Everybody's yeah. getting in there. Yeah. That, that, mm -hmm. And their turnaround is still in 24 hours. And if it's cloudy, maybe I go back to John Deere, see if the satellite imagery is there, and run off of it, or you know, God forbid, I might have to run a flat rate. I'm still on my farm, you know. So it just happens that way sometimes. So, yeah, well, tower. Yeah. 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 We're getting close on time. What's, is there something we haven't talked about that someone was really hoping we would address? Well, you know, I, I think we've had some amazing comments, some really good insights. Um, one of the things I think, I'm going to take, being a cotton person, I'm going to be a little cotton biased here, but if you, any of y'all are running the new John Deere pickers, Wes is working on this with me, Galen's helping. Uh, every time they you know, drop a round module, they can wait. And then if you have HIV system, they'll scan that module. And so, you know, with my John Deere, and I'm not doing a John Deere commercial, but until someone brings me another cotton picker, I'll be pretty green, all right? Uh, and, and so we're looking at, uh, if you guys want to participate and you have that system, uh, if you have the HIV, you could just share that data file. If you put a variety in there, we'll have lap long, weight, moisture of that cotton. And you know, probably most of these pickers are in round numbers putting out a thousand modules every season. So that means everybody that we're willing to share their HIV file, we get a thousand observations. And, and so we're hoping to get some of y'all signed up. We're going to do what's called a virtual variety trial with Galen's help. And the idea is, you know, if we get, it wouldn't take many of you to participate to have a really you know, now we have how that variety performs in Alabama on sand and Alabama on clay. And in, in one part of the, the belt where there was a drought and one part of the belt where it rained too much. And so I think we could really build a really amazing data set with potentially not a lot of effort on everybody's part. So just something to think about. And if you're interested in that, 
uh, give me a yell, and we'll, we'll see how we move that forward. But with that, yes, David, go ahead. Yeah, along the lines of precision ag, I don't know if Wes would be willing, but I mean, the calibration of that uh, round module harvester and some of the stuff Wes has found, I don't know if many of the growers may be aware of how skewed that information may be. Yeah, so um, on that system right now, there's no um, easy way to calibrate that weighing system on the, um, on the picker. I don't know if everybody falls what we're talking about. Know, there's a self-weighing feature on it. Um, what we've been told by deer is that you can uh, reweigh that module multiple times, right, until you get close. But I think even in that case, we compiled, this is just that Georgia hadn't thrown in data nationally yet. We'll start to look at that. We have compiled, I think, 114 different weights, and um, it was consistently high, right? So it's weighted, and I couldn't give you an exact, uh, uh, exact amount. But we looked over across that 114, we did have an R squared of like 0.99 in correlation back to our flat calibrated scale, which means that there's just a weight bias inside was consistent across all those. That was at least in our environment. That was five different pickers. Um, and a bunch of different trials. So there's opportunity there. We range bell weights from 2,000 pounds up to 7,800 pounds. So um, we went full spectrum of what you should and should be weighing that machine. But um, John Deere is now kind of aware of it. We did present some of that data. I think it's presented multiple times, not just our data, but from other states too, at Bellwide a couple weeks ago. And I kind of think that made them aware of it. They, you know, I think maybe that's uh, going to help out. So. I think generally speaking, it was over 10%. Yeah. It's about 200 pounds. Yeah. Basically, is where it was. And we would calibrate just about every day, just to kind of keep it close. And just get it off dropping seven rolls, because that's what we're hauling at this point when I have to wait for the gym to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. So basically, all you do is keep that yield monitor that close, because it's reading off of that weight. Correct. So, so Shane might have another data set for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, final comment here. Yeah, I just want to ask maybe from the producers in the room. Um, Thinking about all of the technology that the new sprayers that Deer is working on, or any other ag companies, um, precision painters, all this kind of stuff, is it more beneficial and cost effective per acre, or what you're getting on the return from the equipment? Um, if you had only X amount of dollars to invest, you know, you maybe look more heavily into investing into the equipment side of things, um, as far as being able to capture data and you know, where that stuff is headed, or do you look at stuff, you know, would you pay $7 to the acre to have somebody analyze um, yield data or aerial imaging, you know, do you think, okay, I can afford to do both of them? I mean, I'm thinking about how, you know, equipment projects are increasing per acre. You're, you're looking at me, and I'm going to answer your question, but I'd like to answer. I think the producers need to learn how to do it themselves. Uh, and, and I think workshops should be headed in that direction. Training where the producers the right can learn how to analyze their own, because every farm is different. Every farm is different. Every field is different. And that producer knows the history of that field, and he knows where the spots are at that are good, where they're bad. That's the way we've developed our zones over the last 20 years and they've evolved. But I think that producer needs to learn how to do that themselves. And I think third parties would be a good fit to start training that producer how to do his own. And that would be a good service if somebody could come in and teach you how to handle your own data. Yeah. yeah. And I think maybe to answer your question a little deeper, in my opinion, I would spend the money on the equipment. I would put a precision planter in the field with the latest and greatest on it to know that my crop went in the ground correctly. I think you're going to get a bigger ROI on that than you are all this data on the tailor. Well, I, I, I mean, I just think we have access to so much. If I only had one choice, you're asking yeah. if you so, that would be my choice. I, I didn't need to direct your question directly to you, yeah. but you spoke on a kind of price, right? You know, you spoke on a price per acre thing. And you know, we've got such a small margin right now that you can spend and spend and spend. And to me, these things are just continuing to grow in the price per acre to have all that analyzed. And well, now you look at $7,000 and look at $7 an acre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty nice pickup. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right, we, we are.
passing into the break time. So I don't want y'all mad at me and get your bill too good. So we'll call it. Thank y'all very much.